I'm taking my glasses off because I've been told that that's a better idea. Well, I'll take my glasses off and now both of us are just walking blind through this conversation. How about that? (laughs) That's right. That's right. Good. (laughs) Well, I want to say thank you, first of all, um, for making this beautiful, beautiful album. Um, I found it deeply moving and at times very sad. And... um, and at times, I actually felt a joy throughout it, but but never without this sense of responsibility. I just felt like I, I was drawn in and I should listen and I should just really try to feel something here that that I can take that I can I can take responsibility for is the best way I can describe it. Well, that's that's a very, very nice comment. Thank you so much. I also wanted to say thank you because I often enter into these conversations trying to walk a line between the past and the future. It, but in the present moment. And I know that the past doesn't interest you um, in terms of specific detail. And I was very excited about being able to talk about this album and and talk about where it came from and what it means uh, rather than sort of trying to trace it back over this Wikipedia list of things that you've <laughs> that you've achieved yeah. in your life. But I am going to ask a cheeky question. I'm going to I'm going to use that observation to ask a question which you'd almost qualify as a question about your past. Um, what is it about the idea of retracing your steps or having to recontextualize things that ultimately doesn't interest you? If you could put it down to one thing, I think it's because. If you have a history, and I now have quite a lot of history, it, it has a certain weight to it, and it's, it's a kind of inertia because um, there's a tendency in the world for people, if you've done something and it's been successful, for people to want you to always be doing that same thing again and again. I can completely understand it. I, I'm not blaming anyone for it, but, but it, it creates a sort of anchorage that I don't really particularly enjoy. Um, so I, I always I always say that people are always congratulating me for the album I made 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that, that seems to happen a lot, you know. Whatever whatever date I mean, it's a 20 year ago album that people are congratulating me for. And it it sort of introduces um two thoughts to you. You think, was it better? You know, have I actually deteriorated since then which is not a helpful thought anyway um but but also it makes you think um did i did i have any better idea then about what i was doing than i do now i didn't you know i i always work in sort of at the edge of like i'm sure you do as well you work kind of at the edge of what you understand you don't you don't generally sit comfortably in the middle of what you know you can do and just do it all over again the, the thrill is to go to an edge that you and look over into a land you've never seen before um, and then go there. Um, and I, I think um, that's, that's actually the whole thrill of working for me. And if, I'm, if I feel that anchorage too strongly, that sense of always looking backwards, uh, it, it just holds me back, I think. And I, I mean, I can really understand why people want to ask those kinds of questions. Um, and I hope they can understand why I don't particularly want to answer them. I feel as, as someone who makes music as well as tries to understand it and speak to artists about, the, about inspiration is execution is to me the hardest thing. I think I think we get drawn naturally into a place of expression and creativity and it's wonderful and then we're faced with the kind of cold hard reality that at some point you should finish and let this thing go. And I think yeah. <laughs> it, 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 in, in, in creating that sort of me, new metric, you said it's okay if you, if you f- feel that fear. There's other ways to get to execution without having to face down a nine foot bear in a bear pit <laughs> that wants to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I always say beginnings are easy. Endings are hard. Um, beginnings get easier and easier, actually. You know, there's, there's so much technological assistance to beginnings, so many ways of getting something started, like, you know, rhythm machines and chord pattern makers and all that sort of thing. So, so there's lots of ways of getting something pretty respectable going quite early on. Um, and again, to quote Picasso, who, who said, um, there's nothing worse than a brilliant beginning. <laughs> uh, but that, that feeling of 
terror you feel when you've done something that, and you know it's good and you just don't know how not to ruin it. You think, I know I, everything you try on it makes it worse and yet you know it's not finished. So um, I'll tell you another good one um, in, the, in the sort of adages about creativity thing. Rem Koolhaas, the, the architect, said this to me. Um, he, this was about 20 years ago, and they weren't using computers much in, in their design offices. They, were still, they would still sit around a table using things like this and this and this to, you know, that's that building there, and we have this room, this hall there and so on. And so they were doing it all with boxes of matches and pieces of card, and they, they resisted going to the computer. And I said, um, why do you do that, Rem? You know, why do you hold back from the computer stage? And he said, it's because of the premature sheen. So he was saying that the problem with you can make anything look really good really quickly. I love you, that if you've got the right texturizers and so on in the computer so you can you know you can put little people in the in the town squares and clouds in the skies and everything and suddenly you think wow i've got something here yeah but you've gotten away from the you've gotten away from the actual original soul the original purpose of it i'm very aware of that when when you're working that it's it's now very easy in studios to get premature sheen very easily and it makes you think wow Hey, look, it's nearly done. And it's a long way from done. You know, this album is done. I hate to break it to you, but Forever and Evermore, uh, Forever and Ever No More is done. Um, it's, a, it's an emotional experience. And I, I, feel it, I feel like it knows it. Sometimes I think art is created and it finds us and then we turn it into something that means more than perhaps even what it knew it was in the first place. But yes. I feel like, and I'd love to know whether you were conscious of this at the time, because from the words, the questions, the revelations put, to our, put at our feet, to the performances, even deciding to work with your own family, the idea is, is to me, a very it, 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 not even an idea, that the result is very emotional. It is for me, actually, as well. Yes, more than I expected it to be. Um, it was like a, a chemical experiment that suddenly <laughs> exploded in a way I didn't expect. So the experiment was to say, okay, I've been doing um, what you might call landscape music, if you like, for quite a few years of making atmospheres and moods and places really rather than narratives they're not stories they're places you can go to musical places um and put it dropping a voice into that didn't sound that um revolutionary to me i wanted to try it but it really there was a sudden chemistry to that which i didn't expect for a start it was very easy to do i didn't expect that to be the case you know, I'm, I'm working over landscapes that miss a lot of the things that normally happen in ordinary songs, like yeah, no beat. There's no metronome. There's no kind of structure. No structure, no, no chord patterns. But you, know. you found your architecture really easily. You can hear that. Like you found the placement naturally of these, of these, of these thoughts. I know. And uh, it's still a little bit of a mystery to me how that happened. <laughs> um, it, it was... It came much more naturally than I expected. Uh, so I would work on the soundscapes for quite a long time. Um, some of them were things I returned to, you know, dropped them for a few months and came back to them. Some of those soundscapes are quite old now. At, at least they started a long time ago. Um, and then finally, when I picked up a microphone to sort of see, well, what what person exists in this space and what is that what is that person feeling so the the voice is really there as a kind of almost like a narrator not so much as a personality but as as somebody to represent a human having feelings if you like that sounds a little bit abstract but what i want to say is that it isn't necessarily me it's not autobiographical in a certain way um, it's just meant to be a n or anonymous, a anonymous, or what they call him. On this album, on forever and ever no more, 
most of the time you're working with people who try to achieve that feeling and then present that feeling. Job done, move on to the next feeling. When I listen mm-hmm. to this album, I feel like it's really, it's yearning to feel. Mm-hmm. I, I actually don't feel you actually, I'm sorry if you take this as an offense. I actually don't think you actually achieved it entirely because I think that it, it no. it's not the purpose. The point is to, I'm, I'm searching to feel something when I hear this. I had a realization which probably most other people have when they're about 18. It just occurred to me quite recently that the primary job of artists is to create places in which you can have feelings. Uh, I I more and more think that the job of art is to present you with other worlds, and they can be novels or they can be films or they can be pieces of music or paintings, but essentially they're, they're worlds of some kind. And the process of engaging with them is saying, okay, I'm going to live in that world for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to exist in that and see what it feels like to be in that world. And that, to me, is the most important thing that we do really as humans, where we we probe the possibilities for the future uh, and for alternative locations and so on by living them in a model, uh, in in a simulated form. Um, So I don't have to go and live in a totalitarian society to have an idea of what I might feel about it because I've read 1984 and I've read Brave New World and I've seen Brazil and, you know, the, the whatever that film was about um, a society. So, so I already have, I already understand the feelings att- attached with those things without having to have the physical risk of living in them. Mm. So for me, art is a safe space to, have feelings in. Um, now, this is very clear to me. When you look at children playing, we, we all know that children are learning when they play. They're, they're putting things together. They're finding out how hard this is, what makes that break, how they feel about these other people. You know, we learn everything in, in our childhood about materials and ourselves and our capabilities and our relationships with people. By playing, actually, by doing them in simulation. You know, what about if my tank is two times as big and goes faster, uh, for example? So we do, we're pretending and we're kind of what ifing all the time when we're kids. And then um, we're told to get serious and get educated and sit exams and so on. And we stop describing what we're doing as playing. But in fact, I think children are learning through play. That's obvious. But adults are playing through art. I think that's where we play. We carry on playing, but we call it art and we call it going to the theater or we call it getting a new album or whatever we call it. But I think that's still the same instinct to see what other worlds are like, to see what it's like to be in in this place and what feelings we have from it. I'm becoming quite good friends with someone who obviously is very dear to you uh, and you to him, and that's Fred. And, uh, oh, gosh, yes. Yeah, and just such a beautiful soul. Um, yes. And we had a really lovely conversation. I, I watched it, actually. Well, I, I watched, I, I didn't watch all of it because I was sent an excerpt of it, and I watched the excerpt. But I really liked it. It was so nice. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love him and I loved it. And, and I loved the way he described you. And he used this word of like the, the, this boundless curiosity, almost childlike curiosity that you apply to things. And it's rare that I get to sort of speak to two people with a, a fairly sort of sharp vicinity of one another about that and not to reflect on his reflection of you because that's just straight up weird. But but is he onto something, you know? I mean, like, like, like where does that kind of idea of... He, the way he described it was that I would see something and yet you would see angles and things about it that, that, that are there to be learnt and observed that I would have missed because I would have been staring at the shiny thing on it. You know what I mean? I have to say, and this is not modesty or false flattery or anything like that i i think of fred as my mentor as well in that i learned so much about contemporary music from watching him working um i didn't you know when i first worked with fred i could see he was brilliant it's it's very clear he's a very very sensitive and good artist um and i was very impressed by that but 
I didn't really understand a lot of what he was doing. It took me quite a while to think, oh my gosh, this is really a new idea about how you can make music. Um, so I, I learned a lot from him. So the it's a two-way relationship, you know. I mean, I'm very flattered to to be called a mentor of someone whose work I like a lot, but actually it worked both ways around. I started listening to music differently when I watched how Fred was making it. That's beautiful. Can you can you go into a little more detail on that and how do you have enough space between that moment and realizing what changed for you when when you started hearing how he was processing music and and, and releasing it? One thing I know, the first thing I noticed actually was his way of working is quite quite different from the way I was working until then. So you know, it's very common if you're working, as you probably know, with your, if you're working with um, Logic or any of these other kinds of programs, that you kind of get a loop going and that's the sort of groundwork and then you start putting things on top of it. And, and it's, it's quite a kind of linear building process. What I noticed with Fred is that he would start something and he wouldn't turn it into a loop that is going to run through the whole track. He'd just have it running for a tiny little bit, and then he'd put something else there, and then suddenly there would be a big hole and there would be a disruption. Um, it's hard to explain this because for people who aren't familiar with these ways of working, but what I think most of us would done or would have done um, is to say, okay, here's here's a lump of land and now let's populate it with a few things. And so you're kind of overseeing the whole process and putting things in at various points in time. He he doesn't seem to work like that. He starts something, and then he sort of stops and looks around a little bit and said, okay, now we'll go over there with it, and then stop and look around. And now we'll go over there. You know, they, they're very nonlinear, his pieces. They They don't have the same kind of homogeneity that you would normally get from, for instance, loop-based music. So that that was the first thing I noticed. The second thing I noticed was where he was taking his sonic material from. He's, he's often recording on his phone, and he's often recording in quite noisy places. And he doesn't clean everything off. So you get in every piece of recording, there's a sort of context comes with it as well. The the sound has a history built into it. No, you're right. He's he's that, as you beautifully described it. That feedback loop. He's not trying to, to to get away from it. He's actually letting it pour through his art and through his spirit. It's wonderful, you know, because we're, of course, we're constantly being told, and it's constantly true that humans are being atomized, increasingly atomized, you know, separated off broken down into you as an individual with all your individual tastes and you've got to have your own toaster and washing machine and wide angle television and everything else. And I've got to have mine and we've all got to have our own particular shoes and so on. So this, this sort of atomization of the world that has occurred really as a result of uh, capitalism and lots of different products prolif- proliferating Um I'm so pleased to see the opposite also happening, that there's a kind of a new movement that says, no, let's just reuse things. Let's let's find things and make sense of them again, use them differently. I sort of wonder, as you were putting this this album together and collecting your thoughts and actually probably listening back and wondering where that might have come from, um, where you found yourself as a, as a human being, as a spirit on this planet at this moment in time, aside from the art, what is inspiring the art in terms of how you feel right now at this point in your life? I have a kind of optimism because I see the biggest movement in human history going on right now, which is, let's call it the environmental movement. Um, Millions and millions and millions of people all thinking about the same thing. Millions of scientists working on new technological solutions that are very interesting, many of them. Millions of people who think about governance working on new political systems like citizens' assembly and global assemblies, different ways of choosing leaders and and of um, organizing uh, 
you know, government structures, new forms of economics being born. There's everybody's working on this problem. The only problem is we don't know about each other. The this new movement is so strong and so powerful, and and every day coming into being and strengthening and knitting together more strongly. And at some point soon, it will become self-aware and we'll suddenly realize, oh my God, we're all on the same side. I would love to talk to you about spatial audio because obviously we believe that that is a wonderful development. Um, that, and you, we've talked about technology and we've talked about the tools that are now at, 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 in the hands of, of artists and creatives that allow them to move quicker and and um, and talk about, was it the premature sheen? That you just that yes. you, the, um, but but we believe we we believe as you know that sound there was room to move in sound and and you are someone who has immersed himself literally and and allowed us to do the same thing in sound so I would love to have a conversation with you about it you know the step from mono to stereo is a big step uh, that that happened in the fifties I guess the forties or fifties or sixties things went from mono to stereo big big difference so suddenly you have this quite big canvas to paint on you can put something up there and something down there and something in the middle and you have a sense of of a big canvas that you're working on but when you go into three dimensions it's a much bigger leap there's there's a bigger difference between 3d and stereo than between stereo and mono i think um then you really are in a in a landscape you know, when there's sounds coming from all sorts of different places and you're not sitting looking at a flat picture anymore, even though that's not an unpleasant experience, it's there's a limitation to it. You know, once once you are in the middle of the, the world of sound, my God, there's so much you can do. It's so exciting. 